So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you again for being with us. Um, this evening, we're confirming to you that we have diagnosed through our Irish laboratories an additional 548 new cases of COVID-19, and we've been notified notified of an additional 284 positive samples from the German tests that you've been hearing about in the last number of days, bringing the total number of confirmations from all sources to 11,479. Um, uh, we have been notified additionally today of 41 additional deaths, 36 of which are in the east of the country, four in the west, one in the south. Uh, of these 41, 16 are female, 25 are male, um, and 31 of the 41 we have reports of underlying conditions, and that brings the total number of deaths to 406. And again, I'd like to take this opportunity to express our condolences to the families and to the friends of each one of these individuals. Uh, a little more detail on the 406 deaths. 266 of those occurred in a hospital environment, that's 266, or 66%. 40 of them occurred in an intensive care unit, that's 10%. 338, we have reports of underlying medical conditions, that's 83%. The male-female breakdown is 240, or 59% male, and 166, or 41% female. And the mean age is 69, the median age is 82, and the range of ages is from 30 to 105. In terms of intensive care unit admissions, we've seen 277 to date. 160 are currently in an intensive care unit, 58%. That's a slight drop since yesterday. We've seen 77 discharged, that's 28%. Uh, there have been 40 deaths, as I've said, and that's 15% of intensive care unit admissions. The median age of all intensive care unit admissions is 60, and we have reports of 79% or 218 having underlying medical conditions. A further breakdown of the 10,385 cases that have been notified from all sources to the HPSC as of midnight on Sunday night just passed, uh, 1,903 or 18% of them had been hospitalized, 275 were admitted to intensive care, that's 2.6%. We have reports of 408 clusters accounting for 1,099 cases. 26% uh, of all of the cases were healthcare workers. The median age of all those incident cases is 48, and the female to male breakdown is 54% to 46% respectively. Uh, in terms of clusters, uh, we have reports of 238 clusters up from 233 yesterday across residential facilities in the community. Uh, 156 of those uh, are in respect of nursing homes. That figure was 157 yesterday. Uh, we have seen 187 deaths uh, associated with the clusters in nursing homes. That's an increase from the 167 figure I gave you yesterday. Uh, out of a total now of all deaths associated with uh, residents in nursing homes uh, and community residential settings of 222, an increase from the number of 199 that I gave you yesterday. Uh, we held a meeting of our National Public Health Emergency Team today. Um, uh, and we made a small number of recommendations which we have communicated with the HSE and we'll be happy to answer any questions in relation to those. But before we do, I'm going to introduce again uh, Professor Killian de Gascoon to talk to you a little more about testing. Uh, um, Killian. Thanks, Tony. Um, so just to bring you through some of our numbers, uh, as of today we're reporting that we've done uh, 90,646 tests uh, in Ireland or uh, across the, all of our laboratories. Um, 62,952 of those have been done in Ireland. Uh, 27,694 of those have been done um, in our colleagues' uh, lab in Germany. Um, over the last week in Ireland, we've performed uh, 20,468 tests and 4,233 of those have yielded positive results for a positivity rate of 20.7%. So all in all, a significant increase in the amount of testing that we've done over the, the last week when I think we reported about 42,400 cases. So we will obviously continue to, to increase capacity. Over the last week, we've brought um, new laboratory space on board, on stream. We've acquired uh, new platforms for testing, which will come with their own 
uh, reagent supply of uh, extraction um, kits. Uh, and also we've, as you probably would have seen during the week, we've brought in um, additional manufacturing supply for uh, the PCR part or the, the testing part of the process. Um, I think in the interest of, as was answering questions that may come later, I might just touch on the results, there are around 100 results that have been alluded to over the last uh, sort of 24 hours that released to people who were initially given um, negative results and subsequently contacted to and given positive results. So I suppose, uh, I suppose the first thing to do is just to, I suppose to apologize to those individuals involved. I appreciate that that's obviously um, a distressing experience for, for those individuals. Um, and as I said, I would apologize to them. Just in the interest then of trying to explain it to the, the group that's gathered here, um, I suppose there are two separate components which I'll, I'll talk through. So firstly, uh, there's no problem with the, the testing um, laboratories in, in Germany. We're very grateful to them for their assistance. They've been fantastic. We wouldn't actually have got through the, the amount of testing that we have been able to get through without their support. So if I may be permitted to be a little bit technical, generally speaking, when we do molecular testing, there'll be results when, in which we detect RNA or in which, in which we don't detect RNA, and they can either be reported as detected or not detected. Not infrequently, there will be results that are reported either as indeterminate or invalid. Now, typically what that means is that the assay or the, the assay platform hasn't managed to generate enough um, information uh, to decide whether the sample is positive or negative. So what happened in this situation, and bear in mind that the, our colleagues in Germany have tested over 27,500 samples at this point, is that um, a number of those uh, results says that about 100 came back to Ireland uh, with invalid results. So in the ordinary course of events, what we would do is request a follow-up sample. However, given the date of these samples in particular, and given the fact that the majority of individuals would now no longer have been symptomatic, uh, we felt that it was not really terribly helpful to go back and recall these individuals for repeat testing. So with the assistance of our colleagues in Germany, we were able to review the raw data from those tests, and we were also able to um, dig out the, uh, the original samples at our laboratory in the NVRL and retest those samples. So in the course of that process, we were able to reassign the majority of those to either positive, weak positive, or negative. Now, unfortunately, when that technical part of the process was going on, the, our data are extracted on a, on a daily basis from our laboratory information management system, and those data populate a, a line listing that goes to the, the Health Protection Surveillance Center, the Departments of Public Health, and um, the contact tracing centers. Unfortunately, the script, um, and I, I'm not an IT person, so apologies to those of you that are, the script that was written to extract the data from our laboratory information management system into the line listing uh, didn't recognize invalids, so it defaulted to negative. So it didn't recognize invalids because it wasn't something that we had come across in the course of the validation of the script. Uh, so in essence, it didn't recognize them. So that's, has, that problem has now been fixed. Uh, we've reviewed all of the other files that came across from our colleagues in Germany, and uh, all of the, the cases have been identified as problem was resolved on, on Friday. So I think that's uh, hopefully is a resolve that issue. But as I said, I would just like to say again that we're very grateful to our colleagues in, in Germany. I would like to reassure uh, members of the public that this is not a, a testing issue. Unfortunately, it was a, an IT glitch on our side that led to the, the confusion over these results. Thanks, Gillian. So we're happy to take any questions you might have now, Zara. Yeah, Zara King, Virgin Media News. Um, Killian, just in relation to, is it just the lab in Germany where there's been an issue with, say, false negatives, or has there been an e evidence of that in Irish so, labs? Okay, so they're not false negatives. Okay. Um, as I said, this is, uh, this is what's happened. So I suppose there's a couple of issues here in the context of, so this is a brand new system that we've put in place. So in order to ensure the, the streamlining um, uh, or the streamlined sort of return of results from the laboratory in Germany. We've had logistic support from the HSE and through our, our own IT service. So what's happening is that the samples come to our lab in the MVRL, they're put onto our system, they're given labels, they're transported to Germany, and then the results come back electronically. So as I said, these results came back as invalids, which as I said, is a perfectly acceptable um, result in the context of molecular diagnostics. And in the ordinary course of event, we would have looked for a follow-up sample. But as I said, this wasn't felt to be um, 
so I suppose terribly helpful in the context of this illness where the result where the pathogen is probably no longer going to be detected after 14 days. So as I said, these weren't false negatives. They were um, appropriately reported on the basis of the laboratory in Germany. And as I said, given the extenuating circumstances or the exceptional circumstances, as I said, we were able to review the raw data with them and do some additional testing at our side and then come to a, I suppose, a collaborative approach that allowed us to reclassify most of the results. It's invalid in a sense that it expired, basically. Is that what that means? No. <laughs> no, it's not. So invalid means that the um, platform wasn't able to generate a result. So there are a couple of reasons for that. One, um, so sometimes there might be an inhibitory substance. There might be something in the sample that doesn't allow the, the assay to, to work. So it might be inhibitory. It might be indeterminate. So sometimes there will be more than one target in a molecular test. So if, they, if those two targets don't agree, the platform will report it as invalid or indeterminate. So you can, so I suppose what, I suppose what I'm very fortunate to have a very sort of qualified staff in the, in the MVRL, what they will do, my sort of scientific, scientific and technical staff, is they can go in and review the raw data. So some of those we will be able to issue a result. Some of those we won't. And as I said, some of those in that situation will get a follow-up sample. But as I said, there was no problem with the testing in this capacity and there was no um, sense of the sample quality being an issue. It's, uh, as I said, they've tested over 27,500 samples. So this is a very acceptable return. And as I said, it's something that we would see on, on a regular basis across all molecular platforms. Okay. I'm just wondering because I know of a case of a patient in the south of the country, for example, who the family, the, this patient had two tests done, actually one at 11 o'clock in the morning and then another when they were admitted to hospital at around five or six o'clock in the evening. And uh, the family were contacted pretty soon after, so it was quite a quick turnaround test and they were told, good news, uh, there's no COVID-19 here. But then the next day, the family were contacted by the contact tracing team to inform them that they had been a close contact of uh, a confirmed case of COVID. Just wondering, how does something like that happen? Is that what kind of... You know, what, how does a mistake like that happen, is, uh, especially when someone ha has had two tests carried out? So, sorry, just to try and clarify, that, so they had two tests and were told SARS-CoV-2 was not detected in both? The family were contacted, yeah, very quickly and told that the, the patient didn't have COVID, but then the next day they were contacted by the contact tracing team and told that they had been a close contact. It turned out that this patient was COVID positive in the aftermath of it, so it was obviously there had been a mistake made somewhere. Uh, so, yeah, maybe I could help here. First of all, it's hard to comment on an individual case. Yeah. It may be that, the, first of all, the two tests... Well, I suppose the question more so is, just, do you see that happening? Is that, is, what's the margin of error on that, do you think? Or just is that, just yeah. to address something, first of all, um, the two tests, I don't know if they were done two, two different points in time. If they were, it's perfectly... Uh, a test can change positive, negative yeah. to positive. Yeah, 11 a.m. and, and kind of 5 p.m. would be... Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's one possibility. I can't, yeah. without knowing the detail. The second thing is, of course, we made a decision, if you recall, a week ago, to, um, to because of the problems we had at lab level and, and, and sourcing reagent, to instigate contact tracing in some people in the absence of a, te of a definitive test result. It may be, and I don't know whether they were contacted, this particular person in, in Cork was contacted by the contact tracing team to, to, to initiate contact tracing because we, uh, the whole purpose of the test, as we, as we keep emphasizing, and apologies again for emphasizing this, is to trigger a, a, a series of critical mm. public health actions. It is a public health test, uh, and um, uh, while I understand people's anxiety and frustration, it is a public health test that triggers a set of public health actions. And last week, at an effort level, we made a decision to, to trigger those actions while awaiting tests, because, we, 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 because of the, delay, the delay would, would otherwise lead to delay in, in, in that contact tracing. So it may be, and without knowing all the details, that may have been what happened here, I don't know. Okay, sorry I have to go because they're going to kill me here now, but just really one quick question. Um, is there any information in relation to any deaths in disability care homes? I've had a few people ask me about that. So I don't have that information, uh, okay. and just what I've given you is a total number across all residential settings, and then the subset that is in, in nursing homes. Those are the two figures that I've given you. Do you, do well, you don't, where you don't have that, it's clear from our operational uh, information that given the profile of patient, and we know from international experience mm. that the virus particularly is uh, particularly um, uh, virulent in, in older people with comorbidity and who are frail. So uh, it, it, we know that the, the, the main, main information we're getting back from our operational system if, is of an impact in long-term residential care settings for older people, particularly frailer older people. So uh, that isn't to say that, that people outside that category aren't affected, such as people in disability settings, but predominantly yeah. the picture in terms of severity of illness and mortality is that in, in an older, frailer population. Thanks, sir.
Hi, Michelle Hennessy from the journal.ie. Um, one of the things I was asking the Minister for Health in the press conference he did yesterday was about expanding the case definition um, back out again once we've cleared the backlog um, and, and there is capacity there. And he said that it would be hopefully the intention to do that, but the, the health service would have to be able to meet that capacity as the demand increased again for testing. Uh, and that would mean that um, things like the supply of reagents, the supply of swabs, uh, that you would have to be able to ensure a constant supply of those so that we didn't run into issues that would create another backlog like we've seen. Are you confident that if you expand that case definition to include more people again, that that wouldn't become a problem again? Or are you concerned that we may run into supply issues somewhere in the process again? Uh, straight answer, I don't have that confidence yet. The work that's happening now across the HSE is to try and build the capacity of a whole chain of things that include some of the things that you've mentioned, uh, include supply of all the various essential pieces of equipment, the swabs, the reagents and so on, as you've said, uh, include sampling capacity, the capacity to test an individual, the capacity to then process that within a laboratory and to then within the contact tracing teams to be able to properly follow up on each one of those contacts and if necessary, uh, to potentially test those contacts and bear in mind if we're in a situation whereby restrictions are, if we're contemplating lifting restrictions, we might actually be dealing with a situation then where the number of contacts per case could go back up again. Um, uh, and then for all of that to be part of an ongoing um, uh, uh, real-time reporting information system back so that we have the greatest chance of detecting in the event that we do start to lift restrictions. Uh, any uh, unforeseen or unintended increase in the number of cases that are occurring in the community for to be able to test that or to, to identify that as, as quickly as possible. That's the work that's underway now at the moment in the HSE. That will enable us to, uh, well, if we get to a point of, of change in the contact or the case definition in line with the ECDC advice, so the ECDC have given clear advice in relation to this, these case definitions in a situation one is contemplating lifting restrictions needs to be very, very sensitive and needs to be capable of picking up uh, any, uh, any likely case of, of COVID and to maximise our chance of that. Uh, and we think we need to operate with that changed, more sensitive case definition for a period of time before we get to the 5th of, of May. That's our, that's our intention. So that we're able to see in practice what that is like. Uh, and in ballpark terms, we know that the capacity in terms of testing while increasing, we're going to continue to need to increase uh, to enable us to deal with a situation whereby um, uh, a very sensitive case definition is in operation and we will want to have every case that's detected, irrespective of where that case is de detected, whether it's a hospital, whether it's a healthcare worker or another priority group or indeed in the community, uh, and for that to be happening in real time. And when I say real time, I mean same day or following day. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Neil Leslie from the Irish Mayor. Just to go back on to the uh, incorrect test for a moment, one of the people uh, involved spoke publicly to a colleague of mine this morning and the, the major concern he had was that he might have passed this on uh, to somebody else uh, during this kind of period of, of, of you know, confusion. Uh, is there anything you'd say to reassure me, describe his experience as, as madness? So, I mean, what can you say to reassure the people like that? So, uh, if I may just, to, and, and stay away from the technicalities at the, the lab end, each of these cases, as we understand them, would have occurred more than 14 days ago. The advice that individuals would have been given at that, at the, at that point in time is even if uh, you've had a test and you don't have a result available, or if you're awaiting a test, to assume that you have COVID-19, to isolate yourself for 14 days, to is and, and for, the, for your household contacts to restrict their movements. That's the public health advice we would have given to everybody. Uh, and in, in that situation, there is always the risk of transmission with household contacts, and that's the reason why we would have uh, given that advice. Uh, and we know that the number of contacts per case for a number of weeks now has been quite low. It's been down in the region of three, two, and, and, and hovering around that number. In effect, we know that uh, with the average household size being in the region of four, we know that that, that in effect is your household contacts. And for anybody who would have isolated themselves for that period of time, who remained well, who didn't deteriorate, uh, if they got to the end of that 14-day period uh, without symptoms, uh, and in particular didn't have a temperature for the final five days, they can regard themselves as having uh, cleared the infection. So I think for that reason, we can reassure people. Okay. Um, and I know you've, you've kind of isolated the problem to a computer glitch. You say a computer error. 
but, but is it not fair to say that the original delay contributed to the error and that these tests would have been retested if, they, if there wasn't uh, such a delay or such a lapse in time in them coming back the way they did? So, the, so the, we were able to retest the samples. That wasn't the issue. The issue, what we said, was that we didn't, re didn't call, call individuals for it, yeah. Yeah, for repeat testing. Um, and so it's, a, it's a very good question. And I think it's just important to clarify, I don't want people to think that we don't take these issues very seriously. We, we do, and that's why the investigation was carried out to try and identify the cause and to make sure that it won't happen again. Um, but as uh, Tony has alluded to, the, the clinical advice wouldn't have changed. Um, and as I said, we have identified the issue. But uh, certainly from the point of view of repeat testing and recalling individuals, it's something that we may have to look at at some point if, um, as we get into real-time testing. Uh, but obviously, yes, there would have been a potential for that situation to, to recall individuals were we in a position, but as I said, without our colleagues' assistance in Germany, we weren't at that point. We weren't at, in that situation two, three weeks back. Uh, is there any update on the turnaround in test times in the community? I know there was a, a figure of 36 hours given for our hospital or our healthcare staff. Uh, is it still that seven to 10 day figure that's being given in? So the, the number of do you want to say? I can help a little bit with this. Okay. Uh, so certainly there's a differential there in the hospital system. The turnaround time is much quicker because the person's under the care of the hospital system is by definition unwell. And sometimes the test in that context plays into the clinical care of the patient and the lab is on site. So we know the turnaround there in some cases is almost same day. In Bowman Hospital, for example, I know talking to the uh, one of the clinical leads there that managed to craft a same day response in other hospitals this next day. The community has been more challenging because of those issues we highlighted many times here and elsewhere, namely the setting up testing centres to play through uh, the, uh, those samples through to the lab and of course the lab uh, issues uh, which were not con which were uh, related to the NDRL reagent. So um, the, we, we are working towards a more uniform turnaround time, not just uh, uh, hospitals but in the community where we have a, a turnaround time much quicker than it is now that would be fit for purpose should the case definition change and inform the social measures that would need to uh, there is no there is no figure for it at the moment as to what it's at. It, well it, it clearly uh, having cleared what we had gone through uh, we're now down to I would say a, a, a level of four or five days at, at top end but, uh, but that, that's that in the community people that, yeah, that hasn't been experienced I acknowledge that fully of most people uh, of many people to date that they've experienced a much longer delay than that and uh, we certainly want to not just get it down to a much more acceptable level but we want to get it down shorter again so that it becomes a very quick testing contact tracing cycle that, that is fit for purpose for the next phase of this sure. pandemic management whatever that may be are you Tony Shane from News Talk? Um, what did you decide today uh, about nursing homes? So there were uh, uh, a couple of things. Um, one is we obviously want to continue the work that's happening and the good work is happening in the HSE uh, right across the nursing home sectors to uh, focus in particular on the, um, those nursing homes that have a challenge in terms of clusters and have been working on that over the last number of, of days and weeks um, uh, right across the HSE. Um, and that HICWA is also supporting that work in terms of its regulatory role uh, and overseeing some of the work that's happening there to further reinforce, if you like, the priority that's been given to all of that. So quite an amount of work is happening. We detailed some of that here yesterday evening for you. Uh, uh, we, we didn't come up with a number of additional measures and we think it's important to continue to focus on the measures that were recommended over the course of the last two weeks and to, to continue uh, to work to implement those and to provide assurance in relation to the implementation of those. One of the things that we did look at was the importance of maybe looking at uh, moving to try to do some sampling work in other nursing home settings that haven't identified clusters so that we can maybe proactively begin to identify uh, if this virus is in other settings because as we've said all along, one of the things we want to try and do and as much as we can is to prevent this infection from uh, getting, getting into nursing homes, if you like, that haven't yet got uh, any identified cases. So we want to be able to identify that and the WHO, or sorry, the ECDC has made guidance available again as part of its most recent risk assessment around how one would go about that. So we're looking at trying to establish some of that uh, um, um, prevalence work and that's, that was the specific issue right. that we dealt with today in terms of nursing homes. Shane, and I had just on, sure. on that yeah. because uh, it, it's it just important to give some context here of the kind of work we're doing in the HSC with nursing homes and, and uh, there are over 500 nursing homes in Ireland and about 20% of those are HSC linked to community hospitals and the like but the great majority are privately owned. So when you look at the care that it, 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 whether they're private nursing homes or whether they're HSC funded and supported um, you're looking at, at the public health 
element, which involves delaying transmission of the virus, supporting the staff, advice and infection prevention and control, provision of PPE, all the measures which are designed to that, that core task we have of, of delaying and stopping transmission of the virus. But in addition to this, um, clearly a, a, a major concern for us and for the nursing homes will be the provision of, of appropriate clinical care. We know nursing homes have long experience built over the years of providing uh, uh, care to frail older people in many circumstances, those with comorbidities, and, um, and that includes end-of-life care. So uh, this afternoon we've had a discussion with our own acute hospital system to see how we can support nursing homes in, that, in providing them with the best clinical advice and direction for enhanced uh, care within nursing home settings, be it end-of-life care or be it, uh, be it care for, for people with respiratory problems and pneumonia, ad acknowledging the fact that, that the, these nursing homes have long corporate memory and have long experience in, in dealing, managing and caring in a very compassionate way for older people, but in, in the context of a pandemic, additional support, clinical and public health will be required, and that's work that's ongoing, it's building up and it's expanding out in some cases, it involves us supporting them directly with staff uh, for private nursing homes, in, 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 in other cases, more generic advice and infection prevention control, as I say, a provision of PPE. So that it's bespoke according to the needs of nursing homes. And its work is ongoing, we need to do more, and we're building this up day by day. Um, and Tony, on the issue of the leaving cert, um, there's still there's a lot of students who are going public saying that they're not comfortable with some of the announcements made. Could you tell us what advice did you give to the government that makes them think that they can have the Leaving Cert in July or August. So wh what have you said to the Department of Education at an effort level that makes them sure that the Leaving Cert will go ahead? So we, we've had engagements w directly with that department, we've had engagements across government, we've provided all of the advice, if you like, to governments and published that in the form of the letter that we would have uh, issued to the Minister and that the Minister would have brought um, uh, to government on, on behalf of the health system, if you like, and that that would have provided the basis for whatever government uh, level decisions uh, were taken. Um, the environment that we're in at the moment is an uncertain one in terms of, let's say, the, 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 as the further you go into the future in terms of the, the modelling, they're less certain that, we're, that we are in terms of uh, um, uh, the spread of the virus and the scale of the infection and so on. So we would have talked uh, to the um, Department of Education given a real sense that certainly in terms of what we expect to see around transmission of this virus uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the weeks and months ahead, in particular from now on to the point at which the examination that you're referring to, the Leaving Cert, would have taken place, uh, that we really were expecting to see continued spread of the infection during that time period. And that's what led them, I think, to uh, extend the, 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 the decision or extend the, the date for the examination to the dates that they've identified. Okay, and I know we you stay in touch with them because yeah. you know this is an uncertain situation for everybody, yeah. including. But there's the a lot of students education. who are. Yes, yeah, no, so I understand. Just, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but I don't. Is it you know to the to if you were to look now at the way things are, is the leaving cert going ahead late July, early August? So uh, I, I, we're not the ones making that decision. Yeah. We provide the information in terms of the public health evidence around the spread of infection. Uh, and that helps other sectors to make decisions that are appropriate to those sectors. Uh, the decision around the leaving cert and the timing of that is a decision for the Minister for Education and the Department of Education and so on in consultation and we have supported that sector and will continue to do so uh, with whatever information we have, whatever insight that we have in relation to the, the let's say, the spread of this infection, the, the, the duration of that uh, and the likely impact of that on society. Okay, thank you. So, David Quinn, Sunday Times. Um, I noticed Matt Hancock in the UK is saying that they're doing work there to try and calculate the number of excess debts they will have, non-COVID related, arising from growing hospital waiting lists and also the economic damage caused by um, the lockdown. So I'm wondering if any similar calculations have been made here. So that's question one. So, so you, you, we, we are making plans, and, and, and we've, we've, we've mentioned some of this already, to track a number of important impacts of this infection, uh, which you're specifically asking about deaths. We report the number of deaths uh, that, that we see sadly occurring related to this on the basis of those that are identified among people who have a lab confirmation of COVID. Um, and we give you those numbers uh, every it's day. It's a different question, Alan. No, no, I understand. No, I'm just, I'm, I just want to give you a more comprehensive okay, answer you. just in relation to mortality. Uh, we, we, that is a different number to the number that's reported in the UK. I know that the UK then is also, as we are, making preparations to provide a more population-based number. Uh, and so one of the things that will differ uh, between here and the UK will be the period of time that people have in, in, 
to notify death. So at the moment, uh, the, the, from a legal point of view, there's a period allowed of up to three months for, for a notification to take place of a death. And we would like to see a, that being shortened. If we can, we're going to, to work, uh, as we've indicated, arising from one of our, our recent NEFIT decisions uh, with the relevant department around the shortening of that legislation and the period of time and to try and ensure that we have more timely registration of death. And that what that will do is give us an ability to be able to see on a more timely basis whether there is in fact an impact in terms of an increase of the number of deaths that are occurring that are being reported, which could, as you rightly say, either arise because of a direct effect of this particular illness, uh, where somebody picks this up and it contributes to their death, or where indeed uh, it could well be uh, some other factor that's indirect. It's not related directly to the disease, but perhaps, and I've mentioned this before, we have seen people foregoing attendance at emergency departments. We have see seen people whose uh, um, emergency or urgent care has been delayed or deferred as a consequence of the impact of this infection. If anything like that is to play any role in contributing to, uh, to, to mortality, we want to be able to, to, uh, to pick that up. Uh, one of the things just to point out to you, uh, in a normal season, if I can put it that way, where you have influenza, we have a number of people who test positive for influenza and that gets reported. It tends to be quite a small number because many people who, who die uh, uh, as a consequence of, of complications of illness arising from influenza may not necessarily have a test that identifies them as having had influenza and it might not be the certified cause of death. But we do see then an increase when we look back over a winter in the number of deaths, the excess number of deaths that are reported. That's the kind of thing we want to be able to pick up and put but to do so in much more real time in relation to this infection so we get as good a picture as we can okay, of exactly you. what you're talking about. Thank you. So, uh, second and final question. Um, so, a lot of healthcare workers obviously are among the confirmed cases and if I pick you up correctly last week, they're mainly not getting it in healthcare settings. Um, so, given that so many healthcare workers as a percentage of the confirmed cases um, have or had the virus, doesn't that indicate it's much more widespread out there than we think? and the confirmed numbers would indicate? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, the risk, there's a couple of things that we need to take into account. First of all, the risk for a healthcare worker is greater than for an ordinary person in the population of picking up this infection. The second is that a healthcare worker is more likely to be tested than the general public. Mm -hmm. And we take all of those kinds of things into account. Uh, we've given, in general terms, the numbers that, that, uh, of, of healthcare workers uh, and a breakdown according to the pattern of transmission that we think has played a role in infecting that particular healthcare worker. About 50% of them uh, we've reported to you previously we think arise as a consequence of, of community transmission. Um, and it's also important to say that when we look at, we're looking at the broad population of healthcare workers and we're looking more closely at the transmission patterns that we see not only in hospital settings but bear in mind our focus on community and uh, nursing home uh, settings that staff in those environments might be picking up that infection and contributing to the growth that we're continuing to see that does give us concern uh, in healthcare workers. It's a significant number and it accounts for 25% or so of all of our cases and has, has stayed at that level persistently for a period of time. But we think it might be more contributed to uh, and we'll continue to report this to you as we get a deeper understanding of this by an increase uh, among people who work in nursing home and community settings picking up this infection who are healthcare workers. As, as opposed to uh, people in hospital environments. So as they go about their work, in other words, they're picking it up? It may well be. Yeah. It, it, it may well be. Our information, though, is that these are, these are community uh, transmissions, and that's how they're reported in 50% or so of the cases. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, David. Um, there are a lot of very sad figures that come out each day at this briefing, and today yes. we have the highest number of, of deaths reported in a single day at 41. I do get a lot of emails from people asking for some sort of uh, something more positive and on that note they do ask what can you tell us at the moment in relation to the number of people who were admitted to hospital that have recovered and then I'm not sure also maybe a separate figure if you have it of would you have figures on the number of people who maybe were very ill in the community but also recovered but maybe the first one if you have a figure on that latest. So I have a precise figure I gave you earlier on in relation to discharges from intensive care uh, so so 77 people or 28% of people who were ever admitted into intensive care have been discharged uh, back out of the intensive care. We have figures in relation to discharge from hospitals. I think Dr. Glynn might be in a position to share those with you. And I think it's a fair assumption, and again, Dr. Glynn was saying this yesterday, that of the cases that occur in the community that, that are not hospitalized, where we have a diagnosis of a person who isn't subsequently hospitalized, it's a reasonable assumption for us to make that that person has recovered sure. and recovered well. 
and that's occurring, we have hospitalisation occurring across all of the cases at a rate of in and around 18% uh, as things stand. So we can assume in relation to the remaining 82% that they follow uh, a course of mild or very uh, uh, low uh, symptomatic illness that doesn't proceed to require hospitalisation and that they make a full recovery and that would be our assumption. And that would be consistent with the patterns of recovery that we, we know exist uh, with this virus, particularly across, you know, well-developed uh, countries and first world countries and so on. So, yeah. And in, in relation to, when are we going to get an update, say, from Professor Nolan and his team of 49ers, uh, experts and others who advise him too, on, on new projections? Will we get that this week or next week? Do you on know? Thursday. Thursday. Excellent. Yes, so that's the intention. We'll try to make that an annual, or sorry, an annual, a weekly Thursday. Uh, <laughs> annual. We could week, be here a weekly, <laughs> a weekly Thursday. Um, so we focus, and as you can see, the pattern we're focused a little bit more. Killing is with us here today on a Tuesday, uh, and that gives us the updates that we, we give you the number of total tests we do on the Monday evening. So that's we're trying to give a slightly different theme on, e on, on each of the days. So yes, uh, we expect right. Professor Nolan will be back on, 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 on Thursday. And so finally, I'd also like to ask you about what did you, the World Health Organization statement today was quite a, an interesting statement where uh, they said that uh, the world can't wait for a vaccine or universal testing to come out of lockdown. Now, I know we don't use the term lockdown here, but just taking what, what he's saying there, what do you make of that? What should Ireland take from that? So we, we need to continue to work to try and keep the level of this infection as low as possible for as long as possible uh, and to work uh, as part of the international effort to try and identify both uh, effective treatments uh, and effective vaccines and then be prepared to deploy those when and if we get to the point of them becoming available. Uh, but as we said, uh, for the measures that are in place at the moment, we need to continue to work with those for the next number of weeks until we get to the point of the 5th of May and hopefully we find ourselves in a position at that point where the characteristics of the disease in terms of the numbers of new cases each day, the numbers of admission to intensive care, the numbers of, of deaths that we're seeing uh, are at a level that gives us assurance that it is uh, appropriate for us to start to think about lifting some of those restrictions. And we continue to stress that we're not at that point yet. You've seen some of the data you've quoted back to me there, Fergal, 41 deaths that we've reported today, uh, uh, over 500 cases, new cases today. So we're not at a point yet where we think we can contemplate uh, lifting those restrictions. Uh, we've said that uh, we hope that the situation will be different when we get to the point of the, um, uh, the 5th of May. Professor Nolan, when he uh, comes on, on Thursday, I hope we'll be in a position to give a further update of what our understanding right now is of the so-called reproductive number that we spoke to you about last week. Um, and then the various measures that I've gone through already in terms of contact tracing capacity, testing capacity, sampling capacity, in an environment where we have changed our case definition to make it more sensitive. All of those things will, will play into our decision around what happens after the 5th of May and our hope and intention would be at that point to be able to ease some of the restrictions and the right ones but to be able to monitor the impact of that uh, uh, very, very closely. Um, maybe Dr. Blinn might give you some of the data in relation to hospitalisation, mm. discharges from hosp hospitalisation, I think he, he may have that for you. Don't have the figure for discharges from for hospitalisation. Apologies. Um, no, just the fact that that over 80% of cases to date have not been hospitalised, uh, which again is in keeping with international figures. Um, and obviously, we have to to play that through over a couple of weeks. Um, but as, as I say, that 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 does speak to the international uh, norm that that whilst the majority of of cases are not severe and can be managed at home, uh, clearly there's a significant proportion as well that that we're very concerned about. Hi, can I ask you again about nursing uh, home deaths, just because there's been controversy in other jurisdictions about that. Do I understand it correctly? The figure you give us reflects um, people who died in nursing homes, who were diagnosed with the disease, but I know the people who may have been originated in nursing homes and then were transferred to a hospital environment. Is that correct? Am so, I correct? so I mean, I'll come at it a slightly different way, if I might, yeah. might Paul. Um, uh, so we have a figure of total deaths now of um, uh, 406 and we're saying that 266 of those occurred in hospital, in hospital in, 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 and that's 66% overall. Separately then, what I'm saying is that in respect of, and the information that we get on this comes from a different source. So I'm putting a, a small health warning of this. So this is our best understanding, and I'm just giving you the information mm -hmm. as best as we understand it at this moment in time, which is that um, of, the, of the 156 clusters that we have reported in nursing homes, associated with those, 
because each of those clusters will have an investigation happening through the teams of public health doctors that we have around the country. And they're reporting back to us that 187 deaths uh, have been reported by those nursing homes. Um, and that was a figure I gave you yesterday of 167. Uh, and if you look beyond nursing homes to all community and residential settings, that figure is 222. So if you take that out of all of the, um, the, the reported deaths, that's over half of those uh, where we have indications from the public health teams that those deaths have been registered in respect to people residing in those community settings. So um, for the second category of figures, you're saying working out from there, Many of those deaths would have occurred in the homes, but some could have also occurred in the hospitals. Is that right? Yeah, I, I expect that quite a number of those could well have been people where the home would have registered in respect of an individual who had been admitted to a hospital environment where the death occurred in a hospital environment, but the individual's residence was. Mm -hmm. but, but quite what that percentage is, I don't have that at this moment in time. We're I'm just exploring the potential, sorry for interrupting you, uh, the potential for under-reporting of nursing home deaths. Um, what happens when a person dies? Do you, do you test any people who are, are deceased? Um, obviously, there are underlying conditions, et cetera, multiple, multiple morbidities, etc. Um, you know, I'm, you know, do you get what I'm get, uh, getting at? That there may be other cases where somebody died with, with the disease, yes. but maybe not of it or partially of it. So what I couldn't assure you is that every person who dies has a test uh, for this particular illness uh, or, or even with the symptoms associated with this illness. But I think the, if, you could, if we call it in clinical terms, the index of suspicion of this disease would be a good deal higher than would normally be the case for flu in a flu season. So I think a person who, who is either very unwell with these kinds of symptoms or who dies this is going to be much more likely to be suspected by attending GPs or others in a nursing home environment than would be the case normally with flu, and they're much more likely to be tested. But would it appear on the death cert then without a test if the symptoms were fulfilled? Uh, so, so the death cert, and I'll ask Dr. Henry might want to add something to this, the death cert will identify the causes of death. And so what we're here is identifying uh, deaths in, in individuals where there is a laboratory confirmation of, of COVID-19, that's the definition that we use. So it, it is a good question because uh, uh, in a death cert, often, especially in some of the nursing home setting, people will, the doctor will give his, best, his or her best opinion what the cause of death is in the context of a new illness, which is lab confirmed as part of, how we, of the surveillance of it. Um, therefore, it is possible that people have died Without, uh, without having a test taken place. But one of, the, one of the elements of work that's been carried out by NEFIT and public health departments is tracking rates of unexpected death in nursing homes and seeing if there's any trend there too that needs to play into the overall, um, the overall uh, modelling, if you like, and, and, and where we're going with it. Because, uh, so I'm, I'm aware of public health departments and I've spoken to uh, Dr. Um, our, our new uh, lead in the HPSC. Uh, she plans to look at this piece of work, and Hick have carried out some work too for an effort yeah. in tracking unexpected or excess deaths in nursing home setting to play, in, to play into our idea and modelling and trends. Yeah. It's worth, I mean, I know you're aware of this, Paul, it's just worth pointing out that uh, uh, deaths in those kinds of environments that you're asking about would not be reported as part of, let's say, routine deaths in, in, in a routine reporting, if you like, of COVID related deaths in many <coughs> other jurisdictions. Yeah. We try to give as comprehensive a, a number as we possibly can here. Yeah. Um, can I just ask about contact tracing? Sure. Are there delays in, in people being... Con um, I know there's three calls made, basically, but <coughs> in the first call, second call, third call, is there a backlog in that? Not, it, we, we've greatly expanded that. I know yesterday in the, in the level one contacts, there were almost a 1,000 calls made, and uh, level two, uh, a 1,000 as well, and for level three, over 2,000. And the team is, uh, I think, the latest trained number are 1,600 people with 285 people actively making these calls. Um, so we haven't experienced delays to date because of the, uh, if you like, the throughput from the labs and the test results which trigger the contact tracing hadn't really put as much pressure as it, as it could have on the, on the evolving and growing contact tracing system. So we're, we're, we should be keeping up to date with it. Uh, clearly, we have to expand it much further in anticipation of the lab throughput uh, going up from a, a low of 1,000 or so cases per day, now up to 8,000 lab results on Saturday. So the contact tracing has to expand and respond in a very timely way to that. And we haven't had problems uh, so far. And sorry, just my last question. Um, the figures for Dublin, the incidence is much higher in Dublin. Could one reason for that be is that we, we, we test more in Dublin centres? Just wondering about that. Um, or have you other thoughts about what the causes might be? Obviously, it's no, multifactorial, but, but could one reason be that we have tested? No, it's, fair. It's, a, it's, a, it's a fair question. Um, uh, but I think all of the parameters around this disease 
whether it's its number of, of, of deaths, number of intensive care unit admissions, number of hospitalizations, number of cases overall, numbers of clusters in, in nursing homes, any of these measures that we report to have been predominantly focused on the East um, um, since the beginning. So the East has borne, uh, and the Dublin region, a bigger burden, if you like, uh, than, than many other parts of the country. But one of the things you'll probably have noticed in the percentage of cases that are accounted for by Dublin residents, if you like, that percentage has been dropping so uh, over, over, the, um, over the last fortnight or so. Because it could be significant as we move on, the differential treatment of different parts of the country. In, in, in theory, but you know, that was one of the things we would have considered as part of the measures that we, we, we recommended to government uh, a couple of weeks back, particularly the week where on two separate occasions we, we went to government with, with recommendations around tighter restrictions. We did give, give, give some consideration as to whether there was a justification for doing something different in the Dublin region to other parts of the country, but ultimately we felt it was a better thing to, 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 uh, to recommend the measures as we did recommend them. Okay. We wouldn't rule out the possibility of considering uh, differential geographic recommendations into the future, but at this moment in time, I wouldn't anticipate that that's what we'd be recommending. Okay. And, and sorry, just, this is not a question, maybe. just wanted to consider maybe publishing on an ongoing basis details of the actual underlying conditions that are, and the number of underlying conditions, and also perhaps ethnic background, just information that would... And what was the last part? Ethnic, ba oh, ethnic, ethnic or racial background. background. Let, 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 let me see if we can get that information and, yeah... I, I, Here's another comment. Yeah, and I, I'll yeah. talk to the people at the HPSC and if we're in a position to make that available, we will. Paul, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Henry, Quiveny Lyon, New Authority. Um, just must say that the Kirsty is the one that Aaron made a party when you all made your listener to he alternate your party when you read some rash. I guess come all of you on the line chance to get that frag where simply a heart Aaron made a door on Dr. Killian de Gasco and made your listen made a heart a listener in the toss all of you. Well, in time to catch the dish again, our see Jack and I could Jack to take a listen and course to start a layer doing your shot back for me big and doing your course or a curly killer that's cheated. Trish Anna Anna Garage of Fad, that was Sanayru be the big and doing size on the Tastala, Horakira, or Suasakusta, Tamajik Dridjim, the Lakia Dakanish, Agusco, Mailishin, big and doing ye, and Tralu, I'm sure, was big Anakij Dakrak, Agani, Niwan, and Erna Kalar Fosta, and Tralu, Sina, I'm sure for Hinya, and none of Tastala, August for Hinya, and Siren Fosta. August in the kitchen, big and doing in a series of fresh I'm sure August ha score a canish in a hospital illig half of the tier a a a torch fin a a torch fin a test all nation and test all over Kenya and virus ur so August and ta ta ahan five ahan kor vechi ahan nish August nish tamijig diru er 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 an an shin an shin an pathway shin maragacha a a a a kor kor garages fejer. So do is going with able to the stream to Oscar to because a a a a skillu the stida cut the shaft and in this I can go forward. But actually, she never figured in the the figured in the no her ura. But actually, she never made dini at a shaft the shaft for curum the hospital made the dini at a shaft for curum. Now, hundred years ago, I guess my dear old Canada, that she didn't do any step breaks the day. I guess I'm clean to she didn't touch. Don't go to any of any. My generation, Tia, our generation, can't catch the yagat. So, um, to she didn't jack with the elegant hours. Um, my dear dear old Canada, to rag in the own is the street in the Tia alt and she Neil na and try you can na aka Neil Neil and the skill na can na aka mar aichers na hospital. From the tier, so to see how that how to do it is, ahan kauru a harsh difficult gas is fed just to those maybe Rashid sees an able done a less severe August na August na jacketi a hand less severe a mask a mask dini esta August dini will galar anchla kaka. Just a very quick question for Dr. Holohan as well. Um, some one theory in some countries has been that the more the, the greater your exposure to the virus the more of the virus you get and you become sicker with it as seen in, you know, there's been a high percentage of, um, a high instance of uh, health workers dying in other countries. Are there any figures available at all for the 2,500 health workers that have uh, contracted the virus here who have gotten seriously ill from it, the sort of 20% of um, sickness cases? Is there any kind of Venn diagram where they meet in the middle where there's the health workers and the serious cases? So to establish what the pattern of severity is among healthcare workers as, as, as yes, compared is, to Yes, to see is there any kind of 
um, basis to the claim that the greater your exposure to the mm. virus, the mm. worse mm. that you get the virus. Mm. Uh, we don't have that information now. Uh, I don't have that right with me now to, to compare those things between healthcare workers across uh, all the healthcare workers uh, compared to the rest of the population. I have heard those mm. suggestions uh, and I have no objection to us maybe having a look at that and, and sharing that data with you in one of the remaining evenings of the week. Maybe okay. just could you clarify, the, are you saying that more, some healthcare workers, workers are more susceptible than others? Is that what you're Not no. susceptibility, it's more that the, uh, I'll use very unscientific terms here because I don't okay. understand, okay. but the more um, density of the germ that they get exposed, the more density of the well, virus that they get we, exposed we do, to. We do know this virus is droplet spread, so, Dro so clearly there are situations, uh, uh, clinical situations, which carry greater risk. And likewise, there are clinical situations which carry very low risk, and that's why the, uh, the advice we give to healthcare workers, uh, whether it's transmission or protection, has to be very contextual. In other words, we have to, it depends on where somebody's working and what kind of work they're engaged with. It's very hard to give single advice to, uh, there are obviously core elements of advice all healthcare workers must adhere to, in particular healthcare workers, that is to say the, uh, the, uh, the, person, the hygiene, the social distancing and so on, but for, but for certain healthcare workers in certain clinical settings, uh, there's enhanced protection and there's enhanced advice required. And, uh, so the advice depends on where they are. Matt okay. Killian wants to add something to this. Yeah, I, I think it's a, really, it's a very plausible hypothesis because ultimately in the first sort of seven to ten days of illness, you know antibodies, your immune system is sort of preparing a response. So if you, get a, if you are exposed to a, a greater burden of virus in that initial phase, it's, it's possible. I don't think we have definitive evidence yet that it causes more severe disease, but as I said, it's certainly a plausible hypothesis given, given the way the virus works. Okay. The, the, the basic question is, is the pattern of severity different among healthcare workers? You'd have to yes. look at that. You would also have to adjust for age because obviously healthcare workers are different in age to the general pop. They're, you know, they're, they're of working age, if you like, and so you'd have to adjust for all those factors to do a comparison. We could look at that. Okay. To, yeah. Thanks. Hi, Roland from the Irish Times. Um, <clears throat> I think you made some allusion to this question I've asked with David Quinn and, and with Paul Cullen. But just wanted to know, um, the economist Seamus Coffey reckons that there will be 500 additional deaths in the first two weeks of April. Not all of these can be explained by uh, coronavirus. Is there a possibility that there are people who have died from coronavirus that are not in the official figures? And can you explain that uh, discrepancy in the number of deaths, please? Thanks. Well, on the possibility, yes, there is. Uh, and it's if there's a, a death that occurs in an individual related to this particular illness where a test hasn't been done or where a clinical suspicion didn't arise of this illness and no diagnosis is made, it won't form part of the cert cert certification even if the illness played a role in that person's death. That's the scenario I was describing with influenza. For, for, for many people who die in a, in a winter of influenza, influenza plays no part in their the certification of the cause of their death, yet we can see the impact of influenza across the population uh, uh, when we look at the excess um, mortality that you see in a winter time when you have spread of, of, of influenza. So the same kind of thing uh, could happen. Uh, just remind me the numbers you said, 500? He says about 500, he says about 265, 270 of those would be counted for by coronavirus. Over, over what time period? Since the 1st of April. So bearing in mind we have you know, in the region of 90 or so, in, in, in enormous circumstances, you could call it for rounding figures 100 or so deaths a day in this country. Um, so you say 500 over a two week period. Is that 500 additional deaths? Additional, sorry, additional I should deaths say. Over two 500 weeks. additional deaths. I, I haven't seen his data. I'm not in a position yeah. to comment on it. One of the things that we will be trying to do is to study exactly those kinds of patterns. And when we have that kind of information, we'll be available available to us, we'll be able to address that specific question um, that you're asking me now. I haven't seen that data. We have no evidence at the moment as to what, if any, excess mortality is occurring um, over and above any, any normal, uh, if you like, background rate. We, 